Tom here from Lawrence Systems, and I've been migrating from, well, one system, one primary system. I've already got my, my lab system behind me, already set up on SureNAS 12, you know, from a fresh install. I've done a couple other videos testing with SureNAS 12 on different systems with a fresh install, and it's gone well. But I decided to take my existing FreeNAS system, the one I'm editing this video on right now, and upgrade it to TrueNAS. So I want to talk about the migration process, what works, what doesn't. And uh, if you are watching this video, I'll already save you the you know, watching the rest of it. Yes, it did work, or I wouldn't be able to edit this video. This is actually the server uh, that handles my video and a few other backup functions around the office. So it so far has worked really well. I'm gonna talk about the details, enhancements, and new features. And before we jump into all that, let's first. If you'd like to learn more about me or my company, head over to lawrencesystems.com. If you'd like to hire a short project, there's a hires button right at the top. If you'd like to help keep this channel sponsor free and thank you to everyone who already has, there is a join button here for YouTube and a Patreon page. Your support is greatly appreciated. If you're looking for deals or discounts on products and services we offer on this channel, check out the affiliate links down below. They're in the description of all of our videos, including a link to our shirt store. We have a wide variety of shirts that we sell and new designs come out, well, randomly, so check back frequently. And finally, our forums. Forums.lawrencesystems.com is where you can have a more in-depth discussion about this video and other tech topics you've seen on this channel. Now, back to our content. So here's my TrueNAS Core system, and it's running TrueNAS Core version 12 beta 2. How do you get here? Well, let's start with, you go over here, we can check for updates. This is an existing free NAS system. You can see it's on the stable train and we just move it over here to the beta. And currently as of August 13th, 2020, the beta two is what you'll end up downloading if you switch to the beta train. If you wanna go all the way into the latest build, you can use the nightlies. And nightlies are, well, kinda of like they sell nightly builds and compilation for what was completed in the code that day. Uh, so that's gonna be a little bit different. I probably recommend, unless you're feeling really adventurous, just doing the uh, beta, which is what I'm using right now. Now, other things like interoperability, because these systems, and we'll go over here to tasks and we'll look at replication tasks. I have them set up purposely to go both ways in terms of one is a push from this server, which is running FreeNAS 11.3, and it lands on the TrueNAS server. Now, I also have, I'm going to go here, task replication, push tasks on this that push the other way. And both these are working perfectly fine. I didn't have any issues pushing data back and forth uh, between the two servers. So the nice thing is interoperability seems to be there. No, no issues with that. The jails did migrate over. Uh, that really wasn't a problem. I don't run a lot of jails other than sync thing in my production environment. So that seemed to work. I had a couple other custom built jails. They all started and seemed to be functioning perfectly fine. So that didn't really cause any issue. I will start with though one minor issue and that's this right here that I didn't see a fix for, and that's legacy encryption. And what that means is it's still using the legacy method of encryption, and I don't get the per data set encryption options on here. The solution that I've seen suggested in the forums, one of them was to, you know, just go ahead and rebuild them. It sounds like there might be, like rebuild as in move all the data and rebuild, restart the pool fresh, and then move all the data back. Uh, that's, you know, obviously gonna take a little bit of time and I'll probably do that once this goes into production because I don't mind the legacy encryption. I also currently don't need to have per data set encryption. I, I think it's a cool feature, uh, but for me, I just encrypt the entire data set because uh, there's not like some pieces I don't want, but it does. it is a neat option and are adding to be able to set your encryption dis, uh, on a per data set as opposed to a per pool basis. So uh, you end up with that. Now, as far as upgrading the pool itself, uh, it's pretty straightforward. Now, this is something that I warn you if you uh, decide to do this, and they have it right here. The upgrade pool is a one-way street, meaning that if you change your mind, you cannot go back to earlier versions of ZFS when you downgrade. What that means is, if you switch to, example, the free NAS 11.3, and then I wanna move over to, like I did, the true NAS 12. Well, moving to TrueNAS 12, it has an updated version of ZFS, so you can upgrade the pool. Now, you can keep operating the pool in legacy mode in terms of the feature sets because new versions of ZFS on the operating system can read and write to old versions of ZFS with certain limitations, but for the most part, you know, version behind is not usually a big deal. But once you say, go ahead and add those feature sets to the ZFS pool and existing pool, and you want to move back, like reload FreeNAS, reload the operating system and the boot drive to be the older version, well, now you got a problem because it won't recognize that pool because it has the feature flags that are for the new version. So just 
But that's a caveat anytime you're upgrading a uh, free NAS version. So outside of that, if you're not worried, and I wasn't, I went ahead and upgraded. But it will not upgrade the encryption because that's a setup issue. And so while it does upgrade the feature sets to the new ZFS 2.0, you don't get that. Now, what's the differences and what has changed? Well, obviously I've talked before about TrueNAS Core and the conversions of all the code. And I'll also mention again, the release schedule right here. And while TrueNAS 12 unifies FreeNAS and TrueNAS into a single image, and this is gonna mean faster features and better testing, et cetera, their release schedule is slightly different because TrueNAS being more designed for the enterprise market and the support is you know provided by IAC systems and you go with the previous how it did TrueNAS. Now they have TrueNAS Enterprise and TrueNAS Core, the open source one, and it's still you know open source, but you get, you know, build support. And like I said, I have a separate video, I'll break down what all the detail uh, means between there. But what really is important is how the release cycle is going to go. So currently we're at beta two and June 30th is when he released beta. Now we're in August and September is when they expect to release the release candidate. Now, what you see as release candidate, release candidate one, is more like the release is for TrueNAS in terms of stability. So your business users might wanna wait till release before they do it, but generally speaking, home users can go on the release candidate version and you're you know dealing with a really stable, uh, mature system in terms of their support. So it's a little bit skewed on the release because technically even though they're calling it beta, it's a lot more like the release candidate was. And when they get to the release candidate, it's going to be like the release on FreeNAS. And when they get to actual release, it's going to be more like the bug fix, which the U series. So like right now, every U after that is like an update, but it's a minor update just to fix bugs, no feature changes. And that's what the U's are. So for any release, you have like U1, U2. It depends on how many bugs they find. There's not like a limit to them, but when they find bugs, they find a bunch of little things to fix, they fix them. They're based on you reporting them, not complaining about them on Twitter or posting a comment on here. It sucks because something doesn't work. You actually have to go to their ticketing system, find the bug, report the bug, discuss it in the forums. That's how bugs get fixed, not by complaining in all caps that this stupid thing doesn't work. Anyways, not to get off topic, let's talk about some of the details here for TrueNAS 12 beta. And I'm excited about a lot of these. This is one of the reasons I wanted to put it on one of the systems that I use, because you know I can do all kinds of benchmarks on my test systems, but it's really not the same as using it. But it sounds like I'm gonna have to rebuild the pool, which hey, that's not too big of a deal either. That's that much more fun. I'll rebuild the pool maybe before I you know, hits full release, but I wanna really test out some of these new improvements. Now, some of them you don't have to rebuild the pool for. Some of them are just enhancements to the way the system works. They have new improvements with multiple CPUs in the system. There's a need to manage non-uniform memory access or NUMA, and they've done a better job of the way they assign this. These are, you know, we're really tweaking at the hardware level all the performance because multi-core multi systems are becoming really popular. Multi-processors with multiple cores are really inexpensive to buy used on eBay. And we've got an offer code for Tech Supply Direct if you're looking for one with a warranty. And that's actually who supplied the R730 that's behind me. I've done a video on this and that's what I'm using right now for a lot of my beta testing and some of the upcoming tests that I'll, we'll be talking about related to these new features that are coming on there. But you can get these systems for so inexpensive now, comparatively speaking, that you know old server hardware is just there's a lot of it out there with so many of the data centers needing cutting edge all the time. They're pulling out these servers. It feels faster. I don't know. It just seems like there's a lot more of it on the market at some really good prices. So getting a hold of uh, this equipment is relatively easy. And of course, um, you know, take advantage of all the things that work on there. Just got to find one that's compatible with free NAS, but that's a, that's a different topic for a different day. ZFS metadata on flash. Special SSD VDEVs can be used for metadata acceleration. Now, this is all part of the new ZFS 2.0 where they're adding um, ability to tune it further and set up a system, which is obviously gonna create more analysis paralysis. So I did a video on performance tuning on ZFS, which is you know an art form into itself of figuring out what the compromises are for how you wanna configure it and you know what the benefits are. Now they're adding more variables to the mix, which is gonna make me, one, have to do a new video and I probably have to get some IX systems people. Maybe I'll uh, pull them in for a video to have a discussion about this. There's a lot more tuning options you get. A lot of this we're gonna talk about comes down to that. So the metadata on flash, 
The ZFS Fusion Pools, a special SSD VDEV, can also be used for data-based on I.O. write size. This is configured on a per data set basis. Users can accelerate database data sets by configuring higher I.O. size. Once again, these are some more performance tuning when you talk about things like how you want to tune the database uh, section. Like you're usually using a free NAS storage in an enterprise environment, not just for one thing, but for multiple things, especially when you talk about a very large server. So now on a per data set, instead of creating, all right, this is a pool for this and this is a pool for that where I tune the settings, they can create on a per data set. So that makes it a little bit easier to manage. I like that as a feature and as part of the you know fusion pool system that they have on there. Persistent L2 arc, which is kind of interesting, and this is the flash base read cache. And it is typically cleared on a controller reboot or failover for smaller systems, less than, tel less than one TB, um, L2 arc, that can be fine. For large systems with like 10 terabytes of L2 arc, it can take hours or even days to rehydrate the L2 arc. The persistent L2 arc option avoids clearing the cache, allowing performance sens sensitive systems to get back and running full speed. So this is interesting because normally it just gets cleared and it rebuilds kind of on the fly. So if someone requests a file, it goes to the cache. And well, if there's a slow spinning storage and a nice speedy flash arc storage, great, it starts pulling from there. And it, because it's rebuilding automatically, you don't think about it. But obviously, when you talk about 10 terabytes of storage on a flash, well, we want it to populate faster. So that's kind of a neat feature that they're doing on there. ZFS Asynchronous DMU and COW or Copy on Write. With ZFS Data Management Unit or and an algorithm for copy on write. These algorithms were implemented in a synchronous manner, which required a transaction to wait till another transaction was completed. IX Systems contributed the conversion of these algorithms to an asynchronous approach, which reduces the amount of wait time and increases the parallelism in OpenZFS 2.0. And that a benefit is that the fewer disk I.O are needed for sequential writes. This increases drive efficiency and reduces latency and heavy workloads. Now this is getting down to some of the fundamental problems you have when you have a bunch of drives is when things, and this is why when I've mentioned like NFS and you turn off asynchronous writing, um, so you turn it off sync disabled for NFS shares to get better performance out of them. If you're trying to synchronously write data that could be parallel written, there's obviously a cost because IO wait time is one of the killers. So people, look a lot at a single hard drive all about transfer speed, but when you get into enterprise environments, it's all about the IOPS and how many you know operations you have occurring and how long is the wait time before those can occur. And you can end up with a problem where you have a lot of latency because it's waiting, because it's queuing up all the writes, but then they have to be written sequentially as opposed to doing everything in parallel. So they're working a lot on that, and I'm excited. This is going to be some enhancements and one of the reasons I may rebuild my pool sooner than later, because I want to really dive deeper into test this and uh, see what the differences are. ZFS checksum vectorization. ZFS protects data by writing a checksum into metadata for each block data that's written. And this is going to use processor functions that are core into the processor, certain Intel processors uh, to do this. I don't have a lot of details on this, but it's kind of interesting to doing it. I don't know if it's specifically using uh, what extensions on the Intel processor, if those are available in AMD, but the vectorization is going to be some more efficient way to handle those checksums. So when you get large like petabytes of, petabytes of data on a server, you do need to make sure one, you don't have bit rot and two, that all these checksums are able to keep it from having bit rot. Uh, there's a lot of files on there and we deal with some companies that we've done consulting for that do have a lot on there. Uh, ZFS record size increases, so they're going to modify the way you can write the ZFS records. Once again, it goes into the tuning options for how you tune the ZFS system. ZFS asynchronous trim. The OpenV ZFS 2.0 includes asynchronous, automatic, and manual trim capabilities. Manual trim can be scheduled overnight for each weekend, provide performance during business hours. So that's the way it trims the writes. This is needed for um, caching, I'm oh, sorry, SSD and NVMe drives. Any type of solid state non-spinning storage does need the trim. And I'll leave a link to this article over in Ars Technia and they talk a little bit more about this. And one of the long-standing complaints about ZFS Linux on Linux was its lack of trim. Now this is going to be ZFS on BSD, but this is ZFS 2.0 and this is an older article. But what it really is highlighting is after several years of untrimmed hard drive use, SSDs can get down to one third size or less. This was a problem in the legacy ZFS on Linux, not something that was on the, I don't believe this is a, a problem that affected the ZFS on 
the FreeBSD platform because it was a little bit more mature. But now that we're moving to the 2.0, um, these are all being solved. So I'll leave this so you can read through some of these things in here, but you got take this with the fact that it was written in 2019, a little over a year ago. Um, so a lot of this has been fixed and that's why they're highlighting it over here, just for reference for people wondering about that. Faster ZFS boot. Um, this is obviously an issue when you have a lot of drives that need to be decrypted. And my example machine over here, if you can kind of see it in the background, I've done a video on it, that is a lot of drives in this R730 machine, the XD. So yes, when you have a lot of drives, there's a pause while it you know, enumerates all the drives and gets them all set up and imports the pool sets on there so they moved into a more parallel way of importing them so it boots faster. Now, iSCSI reads. I, this is where I'm gonna have to redo my test where it's iSCSI versus NFS for virtualization storage because they've enhanced this quite a bit um, on the reads and tuning on the iSCSI. And right now they're saying, based on the hardware, you can get now over 1 million IOPS and 15 gigs a second can be achieved with the right hardware. So that's pretty impressive. Um, numbers on there. And of course, the IOPS are the one, back to something I said matters a lot, is you don't usually have a lot of sustained transfers as much as you have a quantity of transfers, and that's what can choke a drive system. So being able to have 1 million IOPS, that's really impressive on there. Uh, they've increased SMB client speed, so they're going to be able to get faster server message block, and they've increased the number of clients that can be on there. Now this is interesting and uh, to me, because I'm running a Linux system that, well, once again, I'm editing this on, I'm editing on Linux using SMB connected to a free NAS, which runs on BSD and you know using SMB. So we're emulating the Microsoft protocol on two different platforms because it's still an efficient way to communicate. And of course we have other systems that are running Windows that need to communicate with it. So it's just a popular implementation. So they've once again brought us up to a new version of the Samba that has more enhancements on there. But NFS, like I said, the speed comparison between NFS and iSCSI for virtualization, they've also updated performance on NFS. So it's not like they forgot about it. That has you know gotten an update as well. So that's going to be great. And frequently these are used for SAN devices and storage networks. So uh, NFS and iSCSI both being really important. So I'm glad to see the updated enhancements on that. Multiple NVDIM. Each ND NVDIM can be assigned as a write intention log, this log, for different pools. This is not the same, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it, but it is not the same as a write cache. This is part of the way the copy on write file system, it's the intent data that has to be written somewhere fast before it can be spread across the pools. So this is where that asynchronous problem comes in, and this is the solution is you buy some MVDIMs. So anytime you use a slog, it has to be faster than the other pool it's supporting, or it doesn't really provide much value. That's why we've moving over to NVDIM which are based on DDR4 SDRAM. And these things are really fast. And of course, there's now more enhancements on there because we're always pushing the limits of, yeah, cool, you can use an MVME cache. First, we use SSDs cache. Now SSDs are cheap, so now we have pools of SSDs. That means the next step was to move to MVME cache, but then the SSD caches are so fast or we may have a pool of MVMEs. So now we need something even faster to handle the writing essentially for those and the it is caching the the intent data right. It's not caching the entire piece of the data right, but that's where multiple NVDIMs come in to enhance speed even further. So impressive. Um, I love pushing the limits of storage and seeing how we're going to go with this. And you know, TrueNAS is really on the cutting edge of all of this. Uh, updated PCI interconnect for HA systems. I've talked about this like when I did the review of the M50 um, and how it fails over and having those interconnects. Um, that tuning is important because the HA, you want all your storage to fail over seamlessly and smooth when you have a high availability system. So there's more enhancements on there. All these performance improvements plus advanced advances in process performance contribute to the ability to build and support larger systems beyond 10 petabytes in size, which is just impressive. So it is really great that they're doing all this. Um, like I said, I think we're going to see changes coming faster and the demand for high performance storage is only increasing as you know all these different cloud infrastructure systems they all have to be based on something in the back end when it gets to some of the fundamental levels and ZFS being super popular for this and of course uh, TrueNAS and IX systems being at the forefront of a lot of this technology of you know building this out.
Uh, they're also getting in all the uh, documentation is being updated and built out as well. So that's kind of, you know, it's all this convergence of things. And once they merge to one single document base, that's going to be so much easier for the teams that work on the development of this to have a single place to do all the updates versus right now, they've always had to make the nuanced changes, con you know, the differences between them and ever. Uh, I have a whole video on, you know, why they're converging, but obviously you can see with all these extra features coming, putting it all in one place and all one documentation. And the real difference, you know, being if you get TrueNAS Core, you get all the bells, whistles, and features we talked about here. But if you want the enterprise support because you're a business, you're like, we can't just use some open source product here. We need a support agreement and SLA. Well, they still have that. It's the same software. You drop a key in the license file and the software converts to the supported version, essentially when you buy the hardware from them and make sure it's all spec'd out. There's a little more nuance in it, but the concept's the same. It's the same program, but you can buy support for it uh, if that's something you need in your environment. But for you, the home user, or you, the person who just like me is a big open source advocate and say, I just want to use the open source one and I want to have all those features, you go ahead and get all those features because, well, they're available in there. And like I said, I have a video where I comparison and breakdown of them. So I'm going to keep testing. And of course, now I'm excited. I have more speed testing to do. So maybe what I'll do is do a series of tests before I upgrade the pool and then maybe try some of the different fusion pool options. It's kind of in depth to do all this, but it's going to be kind of fun to play with. And maybe if I get really ambitious, I'll load FreeNAS 11 and FreeNAS 12 or two NAS 12 and try to do comparisons on the same system, do a series of benchmarks, reload the same series of benchmarks. These are things that I really want to do all the time. I know people ask me to do them. It's a matter of really finding the time because obviously each one of these benchmarks has a t sunken time to build out, set it up, load, tear down, build out, set it up, load, then do a comparison. The video part's actually one of the easier parts when I do this, uh, but doing all the comparisons is where the time is on there. Me just talking about it, well, that's just me talking about a lot of the stuff that I use. So I'm excited looking at the progress on there. I'm daring enough to you know, do this in my one production system. Maybe I'll move the other one over too, just so I can get more in depth on the testing on there. And the other one's doing some VM work uh, this one just does beta VM work, so it's all my lab stuff goes on the server that I'm also doing some editing on, uh, but it doesn't actually, it's not really production every day. Uh, I don't know if it's ready for production every day until it at least gets released Canada, but you know, maybe I'm feeling daring and hey, why not? If uh, problems are, you know, fun to have sometimes because they be come intrigue and troubleshooting and of course turn into bug reports where you can get this thing better for those of you that are just waiting for this to hit release candidate it's people who take the time to test that get you there it's a community driven open source this is important that community part is not to be forgotten it's not just the developers community feedback on all your unique use cases that the developers go wow i never thought to use it that way that's clever but i understand why it needs to be fixed that way um, that all comes from community contributions oh uh, plugins they worked i can't remember if i mentioned that earlier in the video or not, but yeah, my plugins migrated, but I have very few of them. So uh, more testing will be needed on that. So I can't guarantee that if you hit the upgrade button, all your plugins, if you have a lot configured, will just migrate. That's might be a different issue, but that's another topic for another day. Thanks. And thank you for making it to the end of the video. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more content from the channel, hit the subscribe button and hit the bell icon if you like YouTube to notify you when new videos come out. If you'd like to hire us, head over to lawrencesystems.com, fill out our contact page, and let us know what we can help you with and what projects you'd like us to work together on. If you want to carry on the discussion, head over to forums.lawrencesystems.com where we can carry on the discussion about this video, other videos, or other tech topics in general, even suggestions for new videos. They're accepted right there on our forums, which are free. Also, if you'd like to help the channel out in other ways, head over to our affiliate page. We have a lot of great tech offers for you. And once again, thanks for watching and see you next time.